Now we get a chance to look at a constitutional law hypothetical that focuses our attention on the First Amendment. It also does something that I think is useful in general terms. It focuses our attention on the defense. Take a look at the call of the question. What defenses, if any, are available under the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to, one, Kate in prosecution in state A court against her for violating city's public nudity law? Discuss. Two, Dan, in a prosecution in state A court for A, violating the parade law, and B, violating the state A statute. And we don't know which state A statute, but we'll find out soon enough. So, before we even read the fact pattern, let's relax for a moment and think about an inventory of defenses arising under the First Amendment. One of the biggest defenses would be to allege that a statute or a procedure is void on its face. Under those circumstances, one is entitled to disregard a facially invalid statute on First Amendment grounds. Another common justification for defending a law based on the First Amendment is to argue that the law is void for vagueness. And then we've got the typical content specific and content neutral strings of analysis and also the time, place, and manner issues. That's basically it for a laundry list of First Amendment issues focusing our attention from the perspective of the defense. So we go to the top of the question and at the very beginning we find out about CATS, Citizens Against Tax Suppression. They intend to have a big protest on Tax Day, April 15. We also find out about a second group, Veterans Against Communism. They are planning on having their annual meeting, and they too wish to have a parade. We learn about the parade law at the end of paragraph 2, and that's the subject of Call of the Question 2A. But look carefully at the phrasing of the language of the statute. It looks as if we've got some local potentate who's got sole authority to judge who gets a permit based on how he feels about the situation. Well, that kind of unfettered discretion is no good. And it may be possible for the defendant to escape liability by just ignoring it and then litigating the First Amendment defense later. So facial invalidity is at least one defense to the parade law, and we'll make sure to discuss it when we get down to Section 2A of our answer. In paragraph 3, we find out about Kate, and she is being charged with violating a public nudity law, and we see that she recreates Lady Godiva's famous nude horseback ride, and she's doing it with the express intent of the naked ride being symbolic speech. So certainly we will be focusing on content-specific versus content-neutral regulations there. In paragraph 4, we find that both groups are gathering at the same time, and Dan, our defendant, hectors his audience. He speaks to his followers. He says that we all have to not pay taxes, and he also makes a specific claim that we shouldn't pay taxes because it pays for America's war machine. And the veterans group's not very happy with that. They start to push this guy around. They don't like his message. They start to interfere with him. Well, we know from our review of the black letter law, even in the superficial and highly abbreviated format that I presented it to you, that law enforcement has an obligation to protect an unpopular speaker, up to a point. We also know that it's legal for the authorities to shut down a speech if it looks as if there's going to be violence. Now, let's focus for a moment on the message of the speaker. This guy is advocating that people should break the law. He's saying they shouldn't pay taxes. But he's not saying we should go burn down the Army recruiting office or go burn down the IRS office or engage in some other form of immediate, dangerous lawlessness. If a bunch of protesters don't end up paying their taxes, the IRS has plenty of mechanisms for catching up to them. Here, the police probably had an obligation to protect an unpopular speaker from making his comments. Then, in the final paragraph, we see the arrest of Kate and Dan. We see that the various charges are filed. And take a look at the public nudity law. This is another very typical issue presented in an almost stereotypical way. 
This is a vague statute. Look at it carefully. It says that the nudity charge will be based on whether it occurs within the view of others who may be offended. So we're going to judge public nudity based on the audience reaction rather than based on some other objective standard. It's very difficult to know what conduct is being prohibited here. It's void for vagueness. At least, that's the defense argument that Kate is going to make. Then we get the call of the question again, and we are called on to answer the question. Now, this question is presented in an essay format, but you'll see fact patterns strikingly similar to this one on the MBE as well. These are standard issues. They are being tested here in standard ways. That's why practicing material like this is infinitely more valuable than studying outlines in a vacuum. If there's information in this question that you don't understand, by all means go look it up and make sure you get it. And if there are important legal distinctions that you didn't know, make sure you incorporate them in your outline. Now, let's turn and look at how I chose to outline an answer to this question. You'll see that my outline is directly responsive to the call of the question, and reviewing it will give us a chance to, one more time, take a look at some of the black letter law issues. The first question is asking us about Kate's defenses to prosecution under the public nudity law. And the first thing that we do since we are in constitutional law rather than criminal law is we justify the existence of the statute. So in her challenge to the law, the defendant is going to rely on their police power. And remember, the federal government's police power is in the hands of the executive. At the state level, typically it's in the hands of the legislature. They've got the power to re to. Uh, enact laws for the health and safety and general welfare of its citizens. So now we focus on Kate's defenses to, the, to her charged violation of the nudity law based on the First Amendment. The lead argument is that the statute is void for vagueness. We quote the language where the statute itself says it, guilt will be conditioned on an audience that may be offended. In other words, if the audience isn't offended, maybe public nudity is legal. That's vague, and it's almost certainly enough for this defendant to escape criminal liability for violating the statute because it's too vague. Now, we take another step into the First Amendment, and we acknowledge that Kate has an argument that she is being prosecuted not because she was naked, but because they didn't like her message. And the fact that the statute is vague and conditions liability on whether the audience is offended, this strengthens her argument significantly. Without that language in the statute, it would be a little bit more difficult for this defendant successfully to claim that she's being singled out for her message rather than being singled out for her obvious lack of clothing. So under the totality of the circumstances, my judgment would be that Kate will be able to escape liability for violating the public nudity statute based on the fact that she's being prosecuted for the content of her symbolic speech. Now, you don't necessarily have to agree with me on that point. I do think you have to agree that the statute is void for vagueness. On many essay questions, in many jurisdictions, it's okay to be wrong as long as you are, as long as you are wrong in a lawyerly and articulate fashion. I think you can craft a pretty good argument either way with regard to Kate's liability for being naked. But I don't think you can write a very good answer suggesting that she's going to be uh, Able, that she's not going to be able to escape prosecution for uh, the statute being void for vagueness. Also, we would finally go into a discussion of whether or not the statute would survive a content-neutral analysis. And I think ultimately a content-neutral analysis doesn't apply to these facts. It looks to me as if she is being singled out for her message, and the fact that the statute's void for vagueness phrasing implies that the statute is set up to prosecute people for the specifics of their nudity rather than just generally prosecuting nudity is enough that we'd conclude that Kate almost certainly will avoid prosecution or avoid conviction under the public nudity statute. Now, we turn to Dan's defense under the First Amendment for violating the parade law. Here, the problem with the statute is that the mayor has unfettered discretion. This statute isn't void, isn't void, it isn't vague, 
it's unconstitutional because it grants too much authority to one person. And under the circumstances, since the parade statute arguably is void for vagueness, I'm sorry, void on its face, facial invalidity is enough that Dan really has quite a good defense to being criminally prosecuted for uh, violating the parade law. And that's really his only defense. Either he escapes prosecution because he never had to obey this statute in the first place, or he doesn't. I say the fact that one official has so much authority is enough to render the statute void on its face. So then we turn to Dan's First Amendment defense to breach of the peace. And here, once again, the defense has got very good arguments. Maybe that's one reason why I like this question so much, because they're asking about the defense, and the defense has winning arguments to all the charges. So, we first analyze the intent of Dan. Was Dan intending to cause a breach of the law? Answer, yes. Obviously, the message was, don't pay taxes. We're under an obligation to pay taxes legally, so clearly this speaker is advocating a breach of the law. But what he was not doing was arguing for a breach of the peace. Dan's speech was not intended to cause violence. And it is speech that incites a riot that is subject to breach of the peace prosecution. This speech did result in an exchange of blows, or at least in some pushing and shoving. People got mad and they started to be violent with one another. But his speech was not intended to provoke violence. It had that effect. And so, up to a point, the police had an obligation to protect the speaker. Because he's speaking in public, law enforcement is present, some people in the audience don't like it, obviously others did approve of his message. He's the leader of one of the two groups that's present. So probably, rather than arrest this speaker for violating a breach of the peace ordinance, the police should have protected him. Now, another defense that this defendant, Dan, has to the breach of the peace is that the statute is void for vagueness because the language indicates that the speech would tend to cause violence. And that makes it difficult to understand exactly what is prohibited. Now, from our knowledge of the black letter law, we know that it is legal for the government to prohibit speech that is designed to incite a riot. And we know also that if a speech begins to start a riot, even without that intent, law enforcement has the authority to shut it down. But what they don't have the authority to do is to arrest the speaker for a breach of the peace. If the speaker's message is nonviolent, a violent reaction is not something that we can punish the speaker for. But remember, even though we can't punish the speaker, law enforcement under these facts would have the authority to shut down the speech. So to the extent that hecklers become violent, that can give law enforcement the authority to close down a public meeting and to stop a speech. And that wraps up a consideration of what I think you will agree is an interesting, straightforward, and typical First Amendment fact pattern.